Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I am very excited to get to speak with you all about a topic that I really do love, which is LinkedIn. And I want to offer a, a special thanks uh, after we get started here to the grad life intern and the career peer educator who helped organize tonight's session. Uh, just a reminder for everyone that we are recording tonight's session. So please know that that is happening and that we do plan to share this presentation broadly with other graduate students and postdoctoral scholars and really anyone who's interested in uh, starting to think about how you can use LinkedIn as a tool for networking, especially now uh, during this COVID-19 um, time that we're all going through. So LinkedIn, I really see as one of the best technologies out there to be used for networking. And I think that um, in today's job market, uh, pre-COVID-19 situation, it was a phenomenal tool and I certainly advocated to use it over the seven years that I worked in the career development field. But I would say that now, even more so, after we're in this COVID-19 era, I see it as a tool that is perhaps going through kind of having its moment. And I'm really excited to see how it will continue to grow and evolve um, as we're going to really just enter this different time in terms of career development. So I did want to um, just introduce the other folks here tonight supporting this webinar. Um, Celine Khoury is on the line. She's our grad life intern, as well as Myrna Wasef, who is the graduate career peer educator in the Career Center at UC San Diego. And also my colleague, Shauna Slebiata, who is a colleague in the graduate division working in student success and retention for graduate students. So we're all here tonight to help share some information about LinkedIn and really uh, use this workshop as a way for all of you to build your skills. Um, this is interactive. So one of my goals is to get all of you participating in this. So hopefully you all created a LinkedIn profile prior to this session. Um, and if so, I definitely welcome you to uh, listen to the session. And at the same time, when we start going into workshop mode, feel free to use this time to actively update your profiles, to maybe gain some new ideas that you want to immediately incorporate. So the goal is for you all to be engaged in this session. Um, this is really how you learn to use LinkedIn, is practicing. And it's a technology that constantly changes. So I've realized over the years, giving LinkedIn presentations, that sometimes it's sort of that um, you know, perfect time where I'm giving a presentation, it's live and I go to do a search that used to work and suddenly it doesn't work anymore and I get a totally unexpected or different result. So I always uh, ask for a little bit of grace as we go through these presentations because LinkedIn truly is one of those technologies that is forever changing, which is something I love about it and at the same time something that makes presenting a little bit challenging. Um, so why LinkedIn? I I spent a lot of time thinking about what makes this platform unique and different. Um, and I really think that there's a couple factors that make it stand out among all the different platforms you could potentially use for networking. Um, first and foremost is the fact that there's over 675 million members on LinkedIn, and that's worldwide in over 200 different countries and territories. And these are stats that I just looked up today. And every time I do this presentation, this number increases. So they're continually seeing new members join as well, which I think is a, a sign of a healthy technology. They also have a vision to really create economic opportunity for a global workforce. And I think that that's just another really important um, uh, piece of information for people to consider that you know, the vision is that this economic opportunity will be uh, the primary goal of LinkedIn. Um, so it really is focused on professional development, which makes it different from something like Facebook um, or even Instagram that have different missions and have different goals. And 
LinkedIn's also the primary tool recruiters use to source potential job candidates. So it's a great way to do searches for key skills or particular past experiences that maybe your company really values in a candidate. Um, so it's a very powerful tool, mastering it and kind of claiming it as a space that you know and you can manage and that your profile represents the skills that you bring to the table as well as your vision for where you want to take your career. If you can claim that space on LinkedIn, it will really be a tremendous asset to you. And in particular, during this time when career fairs, traditional in-person networking nights, um, in-person job interviews, those things aren't happening right now. And so I would imagine, and just my best guess and best educated guess is that the LinkedIn platform is going to continually see an increase of participants and particularly recruiters who are looking for very tailored sets of skills. And as all of you are listening, if you do have questions, feel free to type those into the question and answer box and um, my colleagues will work to pitch those to me as needed. And um, for Shauna and Celine and Myrna, feel free to um, you know, speak up and pitch me questions at any time. This is um, you know, relatively informal and I'm happy to, to answer questions along the way. So I like to frame this conversation by just giving folks some metaphors. So for a long time, the world of work was thought of as a career ladder. So working your way up, gaining a, a, foot, a foot in the door at a particular organization in an entry level role, um, or perhaps you know, if you're earning a PhD, you're getting the tenure track position at the school where you're gonna stay at and be a faculty member for the rest of your career. And you're maybe progressing through the phases of being a professor. Um, you're getting promoted, you gain tenure. Um, and that for many years was how the world of work functioned. And um, you know, let's say uh, the last 20 to 30 years, we've seen a very drastic shift in that. Um, this new metaphor that has emerged is more of one as a career, as a jungle gym. So being able to go from company to company or from different career path to a whole new uh, area of interest and being able to re-career and maybe invent a new career for yourself that 10 years ago, five years ago didn't even exist. So that is becoming very much the commonplace in today's market. And now we have this very new factor that is still largely an unknown, right? So I have this new graphic that I've been seeing all over the news <laughs> and all over the media. Uh, it's this picture of this virus that is impacting our entire economy in ways that we never expected. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people who had developed a side hustle or had pieced together, you know, what they're calling a, a gig career um, or doing multiple different jobs at different organizations to put together your 40 hour work week. Um, a lot of those positions have been pretty impacted by COVID-19 and, you know, the numbers are being updated constantly of how many millions of Americans have filed for unemployment in the last month. And they anticipate that those numbers are going to continue to increase. At the same time, we're seeing certain job sectors that are booming and that are still recruiting actively that have great need for employment and for workers. So, uh, you know, I do see that there's, there's both things happening. And because this is so new and we don't yet know the long-term implications, um, it's really hard to predict. And so I think, you know, there will probably be some trends that will continue to emerge. Um, so I, you know, would love to continue to follow this and I, I will follow it. And, you know, hopefully we can do some follow-up sessions to this as the next months unfold. Um, I know there's lots of questions that students have, especially if they're planning to graduate at the end of this quarter and go out into a job market that is, you know, highly unpredictable and one that we really haven't seen before. So, um, you know, I 
think it's definitely, you know, on my radar and on the radar of lots of leaders across the university to really help support our graduate students through this time uh, because it's really unprecedented and we don't necessarily know what the future looks like, but we know that we are going to be here to support all of you. So definitely wanted to share that message as well and just let you all know that, um, uh, you know, there's a great coming together of people right now in virtual formats and um, I'm excited to to do that and at the same time recognize that there's just a lot of anxiety out there and I think the more we can virtually come together and support each other through you know webinars like this um, the better off that we'll all be as a community so I wanted to share a video LinkedIn for many years now has had a campaign that they call in it together and when I think about the power of LinkedIn, it truly revolves around connections and how can that pl the platform serve as a connector of people, of opportunities, of common goals, of research agendas. Um, there's all different ways that the platform will serve as a great connector. And they, LinkedIn just recently released a new We're In It Together video clip that actually um, showcases some of the ways that LinkedIn has helped the community come together during this time of uncertainty. So I'm going to play the video and I um, will ask Shauna and Selene and Myrna to make sure that the sound is coming through and to alert me if it doesn't. Um, but let's take a listen to their new video. us have a role to play. Make sure that you're providing as much kindness as possible. Both Mr. Marriott and I will not be taking any salary for the balance of 2020. Hopefully you all enjoyed seeing that video. I know when I first watched it today, uh, first of all, I was excited to see that LinkedIn had made an updated video that really responds to the current situation and that they've already started thinking creatively about how their technology can be a resource and a way to bring communities together during this uncertain time. So it did encourage me to start thinking about, you know, what, what exactly can we use LinkedIn for at this time? And um, I just wanted to share a list that really I just, I thought through recently. And uh, you know, this is something that I envision will continue to grow as we continue to uh, process through the situation. Right now, LinkedIn has a great resource, linkedin.com slash coronavirus, where you can actually search through job opportunities that are relevant to actually helping with relief efforts for the coronavirus. You also can, um, as a company, you could potentially post opportunities that your company has in relation to the coronavirus relief effort. So there's a lot of different ways that LinkedIn is coming together to share resources with the community. They also own Linda Learning. And so I noticed on this coronavirus page that there was quite a number of learning opportunities that they were promoting. I also see LinkedIn as just a really great way to be socially distanced and still connect with people, with online events, networking opportunities. Um, it's a very well-established platform for showcasing your own credibility in terms of the skills you bring to the table, 
the past experiences you've had, ways that um, your research has been featured, whether it's in publications or on stage or um, in an art gallery, however it is that you're engaging in the creative process or in research, LinkedIn's a fantastic platform that has a lot of credibility uh, aligned with it. And it's also a way to strengthen your resume and your cover letter. So as an employer is looking at your career documents, you know, chances are good that they're going to check for you on LinkedIn or um, perhaps even put your name into a Google search. And so if what you're saying on LinkedIn matches what you're saying in your cover letter and matches what is on your resume, that just adds a level of credibility to your application that really can't be replicated in any other way. A lot of us also are spending more time at home and maybe we're not spending as much time uh, socializing with friends and family um, or even just as much time commuting. And so we might have some more time to spend on our LinkedIn profile and updating it to make sure it really does reflect what we're all about. You also are in this moment, you have this great reason to check in with some of your key advocates. So who in your career has been really pivotal thus far? Do you have an advisor or a mentor, a professor from previous academic experiences, or maybe your current professors? Um, you know, someone that you've worked with in the lab, a postdoc that you've been working with, or an undergraduate student you've been mentoring. So there's all these different people that you're probably connected with on LinkedIn. And right now we have this moment to check in with one another and we have this great reason, right? Like just wanted to check in during this time of uncertainty and see how things are going with you and offer some updates on my journey or my career path or, hey, I'm going to be graduating next month and would love to set up a Zoom call to talk about how you might be able to support my job search process. Um, especially for people that have been key supporters of you in the past, I think this is a great opportunity to reestablish those connections. Also today, I, I came across a lot of different well-established professional organizations that are offering either reduced cost or free online learning and training that sometimes would cost thousands of dollars. So the one that really struck me, um, the Project Management Institute, PMI, they are offering free project management courses online right now. So I put that link in the presentation and I'm happy to share the presentation with the attendees of this webinar as well. Um, but that's just one example of many that I came across when I was on LinkedIn today um, doing some research for this presentation. So just know that this moment has caused a lot of companies to say, hey, you know, Let's offer this content for free in this moment because there's so many people who could benefit from it, um, that it is a great time to, to build that toolbox of skills that you bring. So we're getting into um, more of the fun workshop time now. Um, we, uh, the way I want to approach today is that I'm hoping all of you are actively looking at your own profiles, getting some ideas of ways that you might want to improve things. Um, I know that every time I open my own LinkedIn profile, I'm always struck by, oh, you know, that's a little outdated or, oh, I need to add in that bullet point or, oh, I, you know, I'm now involved with this organization and that's not even on my profile anymore, anywhere. So um, it's definitely a great time to spend a little bit of um, your energy on thinking about your profile and how you can make it truly reflective of your values, your skills, and where you're heading in your career. Um, your wonderful colleague and grad life intern, um, Celine, agreed to let us really use her profile today and kind of talk through the different parts of a LinkedIn profile, things that really matter, um, things that maybe don't matter as much. Um, and you know, a lot of this is personal preference. Uh, so definitely take what I say, uh, through your own lens and you know, you don't have to do everything that we talk about today, but I just want to give you a general um, rundown of all the things on LinkedIn that really do start to matter and I can walk through a little bit why they matter um, and how to make them stand out for you. So I'm going to swap the view here. All right, so when you log into LinkedIn, um, first of all, you, you might notice it always looks a little bit different. And 
that's one of the things I mentioned earlier, loving and also kind of disliking about the technology is just when you think you have it mastered, they change something and make you have to relearn it. So um, just realize it's always going to be a learning process and that's a good thing. So I want to connect um, and see Celine's profile. So I just start by typing her name into the search bar at the top and I see her pop up because we're already connected on LinkedIn. So going to her profile, um, a couple things that I'll want to point out. Um, first of all, there's this messaging area down here. So these are messages that I send and receive via LinkedIn. So they have essentially like a, a, an email tool and I'm able to uh, manage all my LinkedIn communications within the technology, which I think is nice. I also have the setting turned on so that every time someone messages me like this, it also kicks out an email just sent to my Gmail account. So I don't miss anything. And that's a customizable setting that you can choose. There's also up here, this area where you can plug in different aspects of LinkedIn. So LinkedIn groups now lives here, which is a feature that lets you connect with different groups of people sharing common interests. So I definitely recommend browsing through groups if you haven't done that yet, and just getting a sense of um, what professional organizations align with your field. Almost all professional associations have groups on LinkedIn. Um, this also where you can go to post jobs, to advertise. So um, just an FYI that there's quite a few um, different ways that you can engage up here that aren't listed across this main toolbar. So this is my, my profile. If I wanted to go to my profile, I'd click on this. Notification. So every time that um, one of my colleagues gets a new job or a posting is listed at an institution that maybe I'm interested in working at and I've chosen as one of my favorite institutions, I'll get notified. Um, and these are also customizable settings. There's also uh, the messaging up here. That's the same thing as down here. Um, jobs. So this is if you are on the job search, you definitely want to spend some time in the jobs area after you have updated your profile. So you, you know, profile first, but that is something up here in the toolbar that's important. And then network, that is going to list out all of the people in your network. So people that you're currently connected to. You know, here's some of my stats. It says I have, you know, 2,471 connections. I follow people. I'm in 29 groups. Um, there's hashtags that you can follow too because a lot of people are communicating with hashtags on the LinkedIn platform nowadays. And then it also is telling me people I might know. So usually these are people I have one connection in common with. So that's another just really helpful way to broaden and grow your network is use letting LinkedIn do what it does best, which is some algorithms that calculate who you might know and who might be a connection that would make sense for you. All right, back to Celine's profile. So the first thing I'll say is having a professional headshot is really important. So professionally relevant to your field is what you're going for here. And you want it to be something that is clear uh, that I can, you know, I can see your face and I recognize that you are indeed the person that perhaps I met at the networking event the night before, or you are the person that uh, I just had a Zoom interview with at the organization I applied to. You also want to make sure that um, you have selected something that's a background image that speaks to you that you're excited to share with the world and that is ideally appropriate to whatever field you're in. So I love this image that Celine has because you know, she's a literature student. So doesn't it just make you happy that she has this wonderful photo of books, a library. Um, I would love for her to tell us a little bit more about this photo because I'm sure there's a story there. Um, right here, you'll see what's called the headline. So Celine has chosen to list uh, two different roles that she currently occupies here at UC San Diego. One as her uh, literature PhD student, and then one that is the graduate division intern. So by default, your headline is going to be your current job title. However, it is something that you can change. So if you want to be associated with certain keywords, or if you want to um, let the world know that you're actively job seeking, that's another customizable field. 
And what's helpful about that field is when I am typing in a name, I see it listed here. So I don't even have to go to Celine's profile and I can see her headline. So when people are searching for you, it's definitely the first thing they see in addition to your name and your photo. Just something to keep in mind. Make sure that your current location is correct. A lot of people set this early on in their careers and then they don't ever change it. And so it makes it hard to find people to connect with who are in close proximity to you. Um, and sometimes also employers actually search for job candidates within a specific mile radius of their organization. So I would definitely make sure that that's accurate for either where you're living right now or if you're going to move in the next couple months, you know, you're also welcome to set it to that future location where you're actually doing your job search. Um, in terms of highlights, this section here is going to tell me any mutual connections that Celine and I have. So I see here that, you know, Celine and I both know Julia in the Career Center and Erilyn, um, as well as nine other people. So I can, you know, always uh, get a sense of, you know, who, who, which connections do we have in common? And um, it's just a, a nice touch point there. It also s shares that we both work at the same organization. So that's also, you know, just a helpful bit of information. The about section, um, formerly this was called the summary section. So this is also an important section because the, the algorithm that LinkedIn pulls from when people search for keywords for skills, this is one of the sections that's you know, really looked at deeply. And so you wanna make sure that that section has information that is you know, specific to you and your professional goals maybe the top skills that you bring to the table. And also, um, you know, I see Celine here has her particular degree programs listed, which I think, you know, especially as you are um, graduate students, oftentimes the things you're studying, we hope, are directly relevant to what you wanna do with your life and career. So it definitely makes sense to talk about the educational skills that you're building and your specialty areas, you know, what academic area are you the expert in? Because uh, especially for doctoral students, you are experts in that field. And LinkedIn's a great space to really start claiming that and to um, use it as a way to um, establish credibility in your field. Are there any questions? I just want to check in to see how the questions are going. I don't know if Shauna or Celine or Myrna wants to be monitoring those, but just making sure. All right. So, oh, here's a question. What's a good, and you all can just unmute and, and ask me too. You don't have to type them in because it's hard for me to sometimes look over at the, the Q&A box. Um, but in terms of, oh yeah. Did someone? Oh, that was just me. I was just gonna, yeah. Yeah, if you want to ask the question, go for it. That'd be great. Sure. I was just wondering, um, in terms of connections, what's a good amount to kind of make sure your profile has or to people to like kind of like actively seek out? That's a great question. I think um, I, I always say you want meaningful connections, right? You want to know the person you're getting the connection request from. So I get a lot of connection requests. And if I if it doesn't come with a tailored message saying, you know, dear Tamara, we met at the career fair last week and you asked me to follow up, would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. If it doesn't come with a message like that and by scanning your name and your photo, I don't know who you are. I usually decline those um, because I want to make sure that anyone in my LinkedIn network, that I am confident and comfortable in contacting them and saying, you know, I'd like to introduce you to, Myrna, who is a student here at UC San Diego and is interested in learning more about your company. Like, I want to be able to facilitate that connection. So I would say that the number really depends on um, your own preference and your own philosophy on building connections. I have colleagues who have a different approach where they say they'll connect with anybody and then use LinkedIn as a platform to get to know people and to really nurture those connections more. So there's definitely different schools of thought out there. You know, I see here 
Celine has 162 connections. One nuance of LinkedIn that um, I imagine is still the case, they have this, um, I'm just gonna go to my profile for a second here. So they have, maybe, come on. Oh, that was freaky. Um, uh, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to have this like designation that you were, you know, like a, a LinkedIn guru, if you will. Um, and that was if you had 500 or more connections. Um, so again, I don't know if that's still the case. I don't even see it listed here. There used to be like a little badge about it. So I don't think they're really monitoring that anymore, but um, you know, I'd say it, it really depends on your own preference. There's not a right or wrong answer. Um, but for me, it's really about having a genuine connection to the person and feeling confident that I would, you know, be able to make an introduction on their behalf um, or reach out to them and introduce one of my own connections. So um, that's, that's my thought on that question. Any other questions that are coming in? Uh, Tamara, we do have a couple questions. And so one question that's come in is about the about section. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, a recommendation or if you have thoughts on making it first person or third person point of view when you're writing that that spot oh man that's another one where you just see both sides right um uh what i'm like what do what, what do i have going on here i don't even remember um i think i've done mine just without using any sort of pronouns um so that's one option let's see what celine's got going here um, you know, she's, you know, talking about her research and using I. So I think, I think it is fine either way, right? You want to be consistent. So if you start out one phrase with, you know, using the personal pronouns, you want to make sure that that's what you do throughout the duration. Um, and I really don't think it's, you know, an either or. I think it's perfectly fine to kind of claim the space that you prefer and just be consistent throughout. Okay, thank you. There's a few others if we have some time. Yeah. Um, so one question is, in what ways should your LinkedIn profile mirror your resume slash CV and where should it differ? So I think, um, I guess I'll, I'll divide it into two parts. First was like um, specifically looking at a CV. So CVs tend to be longer and um, more inclusive and uh, more, more leaning towards a list than a resume tends to be. And so I think if I look at LinkedIn and a CV, I would say there's, there's many areas of LinkedIn that um, would mimic your CV. They actually have a, a section on publications. Um, let's see here, if I go, I think I might click on, um, Actually, let me go to my profile because I can, then I can click on adding things. So I would definitely add in publications to your profile if you have them um, listed on your CV as well. So it's sort of a reinforcement that they see it being parallel. Um, you certainly should have education on both. Um, if you do have any certifications, you can list those. Volunteer experience, I think, um, you know, tends to go absolutely on your resume. I think um, on CVs, you sometimes see it more as like university service and ways that you have served your profession. So it might look a little different, but I think the volunteer area, this volunteer experience area on LinkedIn is um, a bit underutilized. And I think it does help really show the ways that you're giving back to the different communities you're part of. Um, let me just see. So here you can see, um, you can do publications, you can put language, honors and awards, organizations. Um, so I think when it comes to a CV and LinkedIn, you can closely mimic things, um, especially if you're looking to build connections with other researchers who maybe have similar academic interest areas as you. I think the more keywords you can work into your LinkedIn profile, the easier it will be for people to find you and collaborate. Um, when it comes to resumes, resumes tend to be shorter documents and 
more tailored towards the particular job you're applying for. So in that regard, I would say um, you still want there to be similarities. I would say in your resume, if you have a profile section, you have an education section, and even your work history, you would want to be in alignment, but maybe you have fewer bullet points on your resume and you build out the bullet points on your LinkedIn profile to be inclusive of all the different ways that, um, you know, all the different job duties that you have. So let me see if I can get an example here. So if I look at my own job experience, you know, I have four bullet points um, here, but maybe on my, on my resume, or actually let's see, I have five bullet points here, but maybe on the resume I'm submitting, I wanna focus on three. Um, I think LinkedIn's a way to really lengthen your resume without lengthening the physical resume document that you might submit for a job interview. Um, but keywords are good to align. Education is good to align. The dates, you know, the dates that you're employed. I think anytime there's a discrepancy in employment dates for a hiring manager, that can sometimes be a red flag. So you just want to make sure that the dates are aligned as well. Um, those are some of my thoughts on kind of comparing and contrasting your LinkedIn profile versus your resume and CV. Obviously you don't want a photo on your resume and CV unless you're, you know, in very specific non U S job markets where it's appropriate. Um, if it's a U.S. job market, you definitely don't want those things on your resume. Okay. Thank you, Tamara. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. I think we're, we're going to, uh, 530, right? So we got about 20 minutes. Um, so this is definitely a great time for Q&A and then I can just continue working through profiles as, as we, if we don't have questions. So, Okay, we do have questions. So <laughs> that's great. Um, so another question is what type of ongoing or regular engagement should you have on LinkedIn? Great question. I... I like to set up some like recurring goals. Uh, I like to have a regular cadence of touching base with really key career mentors in my life. Um, what I've realized is that like, I think human tendency is like, you're going to reach out to someone when you need something. And on LinkedIn, that can, it can start to rub the wrong way if, I look through this, you know, messaging feature here and the last, like, let's say that Emma had reached out five times in the last three years and it was always when she needed something. Um, I'd be like, oh, okay, but you know, what has Emma done to help out me in the last three to five years? And so I see it as like a very reciprocal type of work, um, work environment almost. So if you can set some goals to maybe once a month, reach out to a contact, someone who's helped you in your career and just say hi and just check in and give them a quick update. Here's how things are going. Hope all is well with you, you know, and have that be the communication. I think that goes a long way to then being able to approach them for an ask later on. Um, so I think setting some maybe quarterly goals or even monthly goals if you're actively job seeking to touch base with the people that you identify. And maybe you have like a top five or a top 10 list of, you know, these are the career supports in your world and you want to make sure that you're developing the relationship with them and not just in the time of need. In terms of kind of profile maintenance, definitely once a year, um, approach is is helpful. I would say also when you're going through any big life events, you know, a graduation, you advance to candidacy, you decide to go to grad school in the first place, those are all moments when you should tend to your LinkedIn profile. Because there are also times when, you know, your value structures might be shifting, your priorities might be shifting, and you just want to make sure that those pieces of your LinkedIn profile match what you are focused on in that moment. I like to refresh profile photos, you know, every couple of years. I think refreshing your background image, you know, this is when I moved to San Diego from Seattle and I wanted to share that um, 
you know, I wasn't in Seattle anymore. So I thought this would be a great way to kind of show the world that, oh, she's probably, you know, in Southern California because there's all those palm trees. Um, in terms of reaching out to new connections, I think if you're an active job seeker uh, and you meet someone at a networking event or even like tonight, you know, I'm on a webinar, so you've kind of met me virtually because I see your name on our attendees list, um, you know, reaching out to me on LinkedIn and saying, you know, dear Tamara, I was on the LinkedIn webinar and would love to learn more about your background in Seattle because I'm relocating there after graduation. Would you like to connect on LinkedIn? Um, I think reaching out to those kind of warm connections, so you're not connected yet, but you've had a mutual experience or maybe a colleague has introduced you to someone and just following up. I think active job seekers should be doing that once or twice a week, kind of building that network, finding a new connection. And another feature of LinkedIn that is just so helpful is that when you do search for someone that maybe you're not yet connected to, um, LinkedIn is going to tell you how you might be connected to that person. Um, so let's say you have a goal to uh, work at a certain company. Um, and I'm just going to do, um, let's see here. So if I, I wonder, is there a particular company that um, someone on the line would like me to research? This is usually how I go about doing this. Um, ooh, Target. We could just do Target because I'm from Minnesota originally and Target's a Minnesota company. So let's just, we'll just look at Target here. Um, so what you can see, I'm going to shrink this a little bit. When I click on Target, I am giving all, I'm given all sorts of metrics about how I'm connected to Target other than the fact that um, I grew up in Minnesota. So here it's telling me Crystal works here. So Crystal is one of my childhood friends and could be a great potential connection. So what I would want to do is also click on, you know, these 48,000 people who work at Target um, and do really just a more tailored search. So maybe I'll search for second degree connections. Um, let's just see if this pulls up anything. So here, these are all people who work at Target that I am not yet connected to but that at least one person I know knows that person. So here, Michael Stroik, he is a former student that I worked with at the Evans School at the University of Washington. Um, I know he's in Minnesota now. I helped him um, get his first job in Minnesota, and now it looks like he's moved on to a role at Target, which is awesome. So let's say that um, uh, Lysha was hiring, and she was listed as a hiring manager on a job that I wanted to apply for. Um, what I could do is reach out to Michael um, via a message and say, you know, dear Michael, it's been a while and um, I hope things are going well in Minnesota. I see you're now working at Target. That's really exciting. Might you be able to connect me with your colleague, Lysha, who is the hiring manager for, you know, job X that I'm applying for and I would love to uh, connect with her. So, it shows you your connections and it gives you a really like one click easy way to help um, potentially make a new connection in a way that is highly likely that um, Laisha would say yes, because um, I'm not just randomly asking her to connect. I'm going to have Michael uh, say, I know Tamara and you should too. And here's how you can connect, um, which is just a, a wonderful way to, um, fully utilize the platform for truly its, uh, its true intent, which is to help connections and maybe one degree of separation become first degree connections. Any other questions, Shauna? There is a question about applying for jobs. So the question is, what is the best way to apply for jobs through LinkedIn especially ones that have hundreds of applicants? Such a great question. So first of all, uh, it seems every time I look at 
the job search tool on LinkedIn, it looks different and it's changing. So there are different ways that you can apply and different companies have set up their LinkedIn um, job portals differently. So sometimes you can apply through LinkedIn. So you'll see here like this easy apply button. So usually if it's an easy apply job, you're just essentially sending them your LinkedIn profile as a job application. Um, so that's one way you can do it. The, what I would recommend is um, if you see a job you like, so let's say I was interested in this assistant dean position at Stanford. Um, when I click on it, you know, again, it gives me this awesome dashboard and it tells me I have three connections who work at Stanford. So the first thing I would do before I click the supply button, um, well, first I would read through the job and ideally I'm excited about it. I'm qualified for it. I have something unique to offer. And then I would go ahead and um, usually I right click on it because it just um, makes it a little, a little easier to uh, have a separate list that you then can work through. So I have three contacts that work at Stanford. And I would probably say, okay, which one of these um, contacts do I know the best? Or which one do I think is perhaps connected to the right person for that assistant, um, assistant dean position? So that's how I'd go about doing the research ahead of time and trying to build a network of supporters at that organization before I ever apply for a job. Um, sometimes you can't do that because you're up against like a really tight timeline or you see it's, you know, it's due tomorrow. Um, but if at all possible, you always want to build that personal connection to the organization before you ever apply because you could perhaps do an informational interview with that person and ask them, you know, what is Stanford focused on right now? What matters most at Stanford? What are some challenges that this office is facing? You know, do you have any connections that you could introduce me to in this particular office? Like your connections can help you with all that long before you apply for a job. And then you'll have that information to in incorporate into all of your career documents as you go through the application process, which will make you stand out much more than almost all other candidates because so few people actually do that type of deep research. And LinkedIn makes it easy for you to do that. Um, you know, and if you didn't have any connections, you know, LinkedIn would tell you that, but the likelihood that you would have a second degree connection is probably pretty high. And in that regard, you could ask the mutual connection to facilitate some type of an introduction. Um, so those are my thoughts on the job application process. I think, um, you know, it does tell you 21 applicants have submitted, um, submitted their resume. So I would not let it be an intimidating factor. As someone who reviews quite a few resumes and cover letters, I will just you know, very openly share that many, many people do not take the time to tailor their documents for the job or the institution that they're looking for. Um, they, they just don't. And so if you take the time and you do that, and you also simultaneously build that network, that is going to make your efforts much more worthwhile. Um, and you probably won't have to submit as many applications. If you do that deep research and you build those connections, you're gonna have much better results much sooner. Okay, thank you, Tamara. So there's another question that you, I think have sort of talked about a little bit, but if you have anything else to add, it says, what is the simplest and credible message we can write in sending a note while connecting to people since we're limited to 300 characters? I know it's always like this grand like uh, challenge for me to like craft just the right message and just this small number of characters. Um, and I do this a lot, right? So I'm always looking to, you know, grow my connections meaningfully. And so I always have like some message that I want to share. Um, I'm thinking recently I did some outreach to, uh, to some UC San Diego alumni who have gone through graduate degree programs um, and wanted to see if they could come back to do some networking nights and being able to look through their profile and see, oh, what was it that they were involved with on campus? And oh, it looks like they were part of the GSA or they were an intern in 
uh, the graduate division before my time. So then I'd be able to incorporate, you know, dear um, Sally, I see that while you were at UC San Diego, you were part of the GSA. And, you know, my name's Tamara, I work in the graduate division, and I'm trying to build our alumni connections for students that were part of GSA. Can we connect on LinkedIn? So I'd have to workshop that to get it down to make sure it's 300 characters, but short and sweet and yet specific. So making sure that you demonstrate how you're connected to that person, how you met them, where you both worked at the same time, um, even like people you have in common. So like the second degree connection, I see you're connected to Shauna. Might you be willing to uh, connect with me so I can learn more about the work you do at Stanford? Um, it's really about demonstrating the connection and then making the ask. So what is it that you want from them? Do you want them to connect on LinkedIn? And that initial connection, that's usually all I go for. Like, will you connect with me on LinkedIn? And then if they say yes, you can open up, you know, the emails that can be longer than 300 characters. So you just want to be specific enough where they'll accept your request and then you can follow up with sort of more details or the actual big picture requests that you're going for. Um, I also have a request. So in a previous or when you were in your slide deck, yeah. there was a link. Um, there, there was a link that you had shared um, in regards to PMI. Yeah. Um, can we copy that and put it in the chat? Yes. Do, do, do. All right. Okay. I'll to chat to everybody. Perfect. Okay. And I also have another question. And this one, um, hopefully I'm doing it justice to the person who asked. Um, but it says, what are some best practices for using LinkedIn to do multiple things? So in addition to being a student, I work in higher education and I do consulting. Mm -hmm. And I take clients, I want to grow that work, but the other work I do is also important. Um, so how do you display these sort of um, multiple interests maybe yeah. um, on your LinkedIn page? I love LinkedIn that profile. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so LinkedIn has a great tool that allows you to uh, show thought leadership and to write and publish within the LinkedIn platform. I have not done that in the past, but I have colleagues who have done that really well in terms of building uh, their own practices. So um, let me see. So Kyle Elliott is um, just an awesome example. So he is a former Evans School student that I worked with um, when I was there. And he has built this like caffeinated Kyle profile and brand on LinkedIn. And it's essentially career consulting, but it's career consulting that fully utilizes the LinkedIn platform to um, share his personality, to build his client base, to establish expertise. When he was at the Evans School, um, you know, I never would have guessed in a million years that he was going to be a career practitioner, right? Like he would come in for career appointments and we'd talk it through and we'd talk about his job search. And at the time he was really looking towards like public health and um, health man healthcare management and now he's built this awesome career and you can see like he's got um, uh, videos up here. He has um, articles that he's written, um, different uh, publications that uh, he's featured. So I think there's a lot of ways that he's kind of taken hold of LinkedIn as a way to showcase different parts of his career and establish credibility in a field that maybe when we look further down on his profile, you'd be surprised, right? So he was like, um, it looks like he's actually a doctoral student at the University of North. I mean, that's amazing, right? Like, um, so I think through LinkedIn as a platform, you can 
establish yourself as a thought leader by publishing on the platform. You can share media on the platform that perhaps encompasses different aspects of your own um, professional world. You can, you can join groups that also make it um, easy to connect with people who are in different spheres. So let's just see if I can go to my groups to show you what I mean here. Um, so in like some of the groups that I'm part of, I am part of um, you know, the Strive Leadership Program, which is a UC San Diego group, a small group of people who are all part of this program. You know, I'm an alum at George Washington University, so I have that as a group. There's also the Grad Vantage Group, um, Washington Career Development Association. So when I was um, working in career development full time, we started a professional association. So even though I don't live in Washington anymore, I'm still part of that group because I was a founding member and I want to stay connected. Um, and you could join groups that encompass these different aspects of who you are and they don't have to align. <laughs> like you could have groups that are, you know, on opposite sides of the academic spectrum and that would be fine. So I think there's a lot of different ways that you can use the tool. The other thing I love about LinkedIn is after you're in the groups and after you follow different organizations, different companies, you grow your network, it gives you a news feed. And every time I log in, it's, you know, really fascinating um, stories that relate to different parts of me. So sometimes they're higher ed related, sometimes they're Minnesota related, sometimes they're related to students I've worked with or universities I've worked at. Um, you know, James and I, we work together at George Washington University, and we've both been at multiple schools since then, but we're still connected on LinkedIn. And so I can see what he's up to. I can get ideas from him. So that's another great way to utilize LinkedIn is just use it for inspiration and get new ideas that can enhance your work no matter what your field. And it doesn't just have to be one field. It could be many. And I encourage you all to share different parts of your professional life on LinkedIn because it's a great way to do it. I hope that answers it. <laughs> I think we're about at time. Is there any like final question? Final lingering? All right. Well, I think that about wraps up for our time. Um, we'd love to hear from participants. So like I said, we can certainly send out the PowerPoint. That's um, really easy for us to do. And if you have more questions or more ideas or you know, would appreciate uh, another in-depth LinkedIn workshop. Definitely happy to make that happen for everybody. So thanks so much for tuning in and thanks again to Shauna and Celine and Myrna for assisting with all the technical aspects and thanks to all the attendees for um, tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to doing it again soon.